galaxy spinning a heavenly dance oh god all that you are is so overwhelming and i hear the sound of your voice all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise oh god all that you are is so Good morning and welcome to Now Then Alliance Church. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, my name is Nate Kemper. I'm the lead pastor here and love that we gather each and every week to celebrate Jesus together. Uh, we'll continue to do that uh, this morning in a number of different ways. We'll have a time here of uh, singing songs of praise together to who God is. We'll have a time of looking at God's word together as we continue in our uh, series talking about what our family rhythms are designed to be like by God. And then we'll have a time uh, particularly this morning where we'll get to celebrate communion together. And so as you came in, if you're here present and didn't grab communion elements, I'd encourage you to grab those for use a little bit later in the service. If you're engaging with us digitally, I encourage you uh, to get elements ready in your home for that time in the service as well. As a church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ and believe we do that best as we connect with each other, grow in our own relationship with God and encourage others to do the same. And as we participate in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. And we're excited for some of that participation option today to be in our worship together. And so my hope is that our hearts are ready for that, that we've come ready to not just engage 
passively in worship, not just to watch others worship, but we've come to worship God well, and we recognize that as we do that, uh, He's not distant. God is here, and He's with us, and He responds and engages with us, and so our hope is that as we would worship Him, that we'd also be open to the ways He may be encouraging us, loving on us, challenging us, speaking to us about who He longs for us to be and how we can do that well as we worship Him. I want to pray to that end as we get started this morning. Would you join me in that? God, we're thankful for your goodness and we're thankful for our abilities to be able to come and freely worship you together. And so we pray that that would be our heart's focus, that anything that had been distracting us from that, that any chaos of our morning, uh, that any frustrations from our week, that for a moment we'd be able to, to focus ourselves not on those things, but on you. Help us to do that in song. Help us to do that uh, in communion. Help us to do that as we study your word together. Help us reveal to us the things you long to be true in our lives. Transform us more into the people you long for us to be as we gather together individually and corporately to worship you. We do so, we know, because of the spirit you've given us longs to cry out and do just that. And so we pray it would happen. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin, why don't you stand with me as we worship? Sing to him. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our brain. Yes, Lord. Open up the heavens. I want to see you, Lord. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face. We're looking to the sky. You're glowing like a cloud. You're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. We want to see you, Lord. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. distractions out of our way. We want to see you. Show us, show us your glory. Show Open up the floodgates, 
a mighty river flowing from your heart. see you Lord come reveal yourself to us Lord today take away the distractions Jesus we want to come in contact with you we want to know you continue singing to him I want to be close close to your side so heaven is real and death is a lie I want to see your noises of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, there's none beside thee, God
things in us today, Jesus. You may be seated. One of the wonderful ways that we get to continue celebrating our great God is through communion together, instituted by Jesus as a way for us to reflect on his broken body and his shed blood on our behalf. Often when I am instructing us and guiding us through this process, you may hear me quote from uh, Apostle Paul talking to the church in Corinth about what it means for us to take communion in a worthy manner and we should do that and what it means for us to examine ourselves before we take communion and we should do that yet this morning I want us to focus on another thing Paul says about communion one we don't as often talk about uh, we're in the middle of a series where we're talking about uh, the rhythms God has for us and that they're not just individual rhythms. Right now we're talking about how those rhythms include our families and we'll look at how they include all of our other believers as well. And some of that is the reason Paul is actually writing about communion to the church in Corinth. He says this to them, in the following directives I have no praise for you for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers, and as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Paul, as he's writing about communion to the church in Corinth, is writing about it because they've become a divided church. And that they've divided over things that clearly aren't what's most important. Because he says when they come together to do communion, they can't even commit to doing that well together. That their divisions have outpoured from whatever they stemmed from into the way that they're treating each other as they celebrate who Jesus is. He says, if that's the case, you're not even celebrating who Jesus is. You're not even doing communion. It's not the Lord's Supper. God's hope for all of us is that as we would take communion, we would do it well, and we would examine ourselves, and we would reflect, and we would be worthy, and yet it shows that that extends beyond just our own personal relationship with God, that there's an understanding as we celebrate communion well that we should be doing so in unity with those around us, that we should all be able to agree and be unified together on who Christ is. On his death and resurrection being what's most important. And so that's what Paul encourages. That we would eat of the bread and drink of the cup in a worthy manner. That if we don't, we'd be guilty of sinning. Saying that primarily about the way we divide and judge others. Are we able to unite on that? The wonderful truth of communion is that it allows us to be reminded of the reason we are able to unite, the grace that's extended to us through Christ, the grace that's extended to others through Christ. And that as we hold to that truth, as we remind ourselves on Jesus' cost to provide that truth, his broken body and his shed blood, and we take solace in the fact that judgment that comes from God always views Christ's restoration and redemption above any of our behaviors or anyone else's behaviors and that we'd be able to together join in unified focus of our savior celebrating him together in just a few moments we'll do that and paul says that we should do it together that whenever we gather to eat we should do this together And so I'll lead us in that here in a moment, but would encourage us as we get ready for that to reflect well, to reflect well on any judgments we have of other people and then repent of those and ask for forgiveness of those, to reflect on any divisions we've created and repent of those and unify ourselves instead on what's most important 
and what's most true to reflect on what Christ was willing to do for us, his broken body and his shed blood. And as we reflect on that, to be solidified in our restoration through Christ and then to participate in this in unison with those around us. We'll do that in just a few moments after we spend some time reflecting. Let me pray for us as we do. Now, God, we long uh, to center ourselves on the love of Christ expressed through his broken body and shed blood and resurrection. And as we do so, help us to then unify that as the thing that matters to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to be devoid of divisions that are creating groups behaving one way but not unified in judging others. Help us instead to come back to the foot of the cross. to see your love, to be transformed by it and commit to walking that out in whatever way we can as we reflect on Jesus' death on our behalf. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we don't deserve what Christ has done for us, and yet we're thankful for it. It was our body that should be broken and our blood that should be set, sh- shed because of our own sin. And yet Christ not only took that for us, but then defeated that death with his resurrection. Extends us life so that we can have restoration in our relationship with you, so that we can have eternity with you, so that we can be made righteous because of what he's done. And so as we celebrate that in unity, with our brothers and sisters in Christ around us. We pray it would be honoring of what Jesus has done, of what you've done for us, and how you've redeemed us. We pray that we would reflect that well as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue that worship and song. If you're able, I'd encourage you to stand with us as we do. Let's take a few moments and just delight in him. Use that scripture. Go ahead and go back to that scripture. Yeah. the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, your way.
Though the oceans roar, you are the Lord of all. The one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea. The nations rage, I know my God is in control. Put our trust in you, Lord. Though the oceans roar, you are the Lord of all. The one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Do that now, Lord. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea. The nations rage, I know my God is in control. With us in the storm, oh Lord, you will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go with the Lord of hosts? Again, Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shell. God, we're thankful for your leadership and pray that we understand that you're in the midst of our successes and in the midst of our battles, that you continue to lead and we don't go anywhere that you aren't. Pray that all our lives would reflect that awareness and that knowledge and that we would move forward understanding how active you are in everything we do. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. I said earlier, we exist to connect and grow and participate with each other so that people would be equipped to find life and faith in Christ. And there's some opportunities coming up in the next few weeks that make those things available for you and uh, something you can even do now to help that be available as well. If you're with us in the room and grabbed a bulletin, we'd love to connect with you in prayer. You can fill that out on the back of this connection card. If you're engaging with us digitally, you can do that through the contact form on our website as well. And we'd love to come alongside you as God is alongside you and praying for the things we hope to see him accomplish and or celebrating the things that he has accomplished. Uh, Another great way that you can join us and connect with others in worship of God is coming up in two weeks on Sunday night the 16th. We'll have a night of worship at the barn that was postponed from last week um, but we're looking forward to that coming up in two weeks and so I'd encourage you to put that on your calendar for that evening and join us as we continue in our worship not just while we're here together but in other places as well and at the barn that night. An opportunity for those of you particularly in a significant relationships, so married or engaged or close to engagement and things like that, as we continue in our series of the rhythms with our family, we'll get to a moment here in a few weeks where we'll be addressing that significant relationship. And alongside that, we have an opportunity that's uh, potentially helpful for your uh, relationship as well as helpful for us as a church, and that's to take an inventory on your marriage. We'll be doing that through a company called Prepare and Enrich. That's what we often use to do premarital counseling with our couples. That's the prepare side, or marital counseling with our couples. That's the enrich side of what they do. And we're going to make that inventory available uh, for our couples to have opportunity to participate. And as you would do that, uh, you would see the results of that for your individual couple. I wouldn't have access to your personalized results. But it would help you understand where the strengths of your relationship at currently. And are there areas that maybe are worth having some conversation about. Because you could improve and make your relationship better through those kinds of things. And so you'll get access to a detail detailed report uh, of your individual relationship but then collectively as a church we'll get data about the health of the marriages or relationships in our church so we would be able to navigate like hey 
Everybody in our church apparently is bad at talking about money. Maybe you should do something with marriages and money. Or nobody can figure out how to have a good time in their relationship anymore. Just Everybody's just going through a routine and hasn't figured out how to date each other well. And so we'll get data on things that we can bring alongside in Sunday school classes, sermons, ministries to help the marriages in our congregation as well. And so I'm hoping as many couples uh, as there are would fill that out. It'll come available uh, in two weeks. I'll roll out more of the details about that, but there'll be about a week and a half to two week window where you'll have opportunity to take that inventory uh, for the benefit of your marriage and the benefit of how we can uh, come alongside marriages in our church as well. And so look forward to that in a couple of weeks also. And then I want to just remind you of one of the ways you can participate. You can find this again in the bulletin. Um, There's a number of uh, children's ministry opportunities that aim to be an outreach to the community around us as well. And so we need volunteers to help run some of those things. If you're willing to help coach soccer or baseball, you don't need a lot of expertise in that. There'll be training that comes alongside that on how to do that well. Uh, You can do that. We'll be looking for somebody that can help kind of be the medical contact during those events at the park um, throughout the Wednesday nights this summer as well. I would love to have you join in that. Or if you're available near the end of July, as we're going to do our vacation Bible school. We can always use leaders in a variety of different roles. If you like doing crafts or games or uh, leading groups around the building and just keeping them uh, behaved and having fun or teaching different courses, there's a lot of different opportunities for that. All of those are things you can contact our children's director, Sherry, about or swing by the children's wing and talk to her face-to-face about that as well. We'd love to have you participate in that. Uh, The last thing I just want to inform you about, it's not necessarily an opportunity except an opportunity to meet someone new in a couple of weeks. We, uh, this last Tuesday, offered the student ministries director position to Josh Hansen, and on Wednesday he accepted that position. And so uh, he will be joining us uh, Monday, May 10th will be his first day. Uh, And then he and Rob will work together for a couple of weeks as they transition before Rob leaves to plant Compassion Church fully. Um, And then Josh will take over the student ministries director position at our church. We're excited about that. He and his wife Brooke will start that Monday. We'll introduce them really formally that Sunday the 16th, but um, you can start praying for them, looking forward to welcoming them and getting to know them as well. I'm excited about what he will bring for our students, their families, and for our church all together and look forward to introducing him here in a couple of weeks. As we continue to worship, many of us do so by giving back to God some of what he's blessed us with. If you're new here or visiting here, we don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. Though, If you'd like to join us in worshiping God in this way, you can do so physically through the offering box in the back of the room or anybody can give digitally through nowwithanalliance.org. There's a give tab on our website there as a way to give back to God as well. Our hopes in the midst of that, though, isn't that it would just be a formal processed interaction, but that it would be worship and that it would be used well for God's kingdom. And so I want to pray to that end. Would you join me in that? God, we're thankful for what you've blessed us with, most importantly, the blessing of life that you've extended to us through Christ. Yet we recognize many other blessings, and as we take time to give some of them back to you, we pray it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship and that you would use these gifts to spread your love and to grow your kingdom in a world that could desperately use more of it. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand just one more time with us here. And he's stronger. We did as stronger is the one who fights for us. He will never fail. You will never fail. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Hope it.
brought a physical or digital Bible and are going to want to follow along will primarily be in the book of 1 Samuel today. We're continuing in our rhythm series. We spent a portion of the beginning of the year as we're resetting our rhythms after a year that disrupted so many of them, looking forward to the rhythms God has for us instead of just the rhythms we may choose for ourselves. And so we've talked about what it looks like for our personal rhythms to line up with rhythms God would have designed for us. And we've moved now into an understanding of uh, God having rhythms not just for us as individuals, but for us as families. We'll end up talking about our rhythms in community with other believers and then ultimately our rhythms as we need to impact the world around us as well. And the last couple of weeks we've kind of topically started looking through what it looks like to have our family in rhythm together as God would design it. And starting today we're going to spend a bunch of weeks here over the course of the next uh, two months probably uh, talking about our family rhythms as we do a case study from the life of David. And so we'll be looking at David's life over the next season at a number of different parts of his life and his family life to see what we can learn about our own families and our own rhythms because of it. I want to clarify in advance, though, we won't be going verse by verse through all of David's life. You may ask, well, why not? Verse by verse is one of Nate's favorite ways to preach, and I love when we do that. I do too, but I want to be clear, that would take forever. There's more about David in the Bible than there is any other Old Testament person. Only Christ has more scripture designated to him in the Bible than David does. Uh, Just by way of example, there are 10 chapters that cover everything we read about Elijah. 11 chapters over the life of Jacob. Abraham and Joseph each get 14 chapters designated to them. David has 66 There's also 59 New Testament references and a bunch of psalms that he wrote as well. In fact, with what scripture records about David's life, we know more about David's family than anyone in scripture, including Christ. We know some of the events of others, like, well, Abraham had sons by more than one wife. That's also true of David. Isaac had sons that were aiming to trick him. That's also true of David. Jacob had family members that were out to kill him. That's also true of David. 
Almost every kind of family story is represented in David's life. Healthy things to celebrate and that are praised, God, God is praised for. Broken things that are dysfunctional and sin that has consequences. The entire gamut of family relationship shows up in David's story. And so we'll see through the next uh, few weeks and months together what we can learn about our families and how God has interacted with David and his family. Before we jump into that, I want to just begin with some of the context of, of where David shows up in Scripture. Uh, the people of God have had a season in the promised land where they were ruled by judges. Uh, they, things would go well for them as they would worship God under the leadership of a judge. And then when he would die, things usually went poorly because the people of God stopped worshiping God and started worshiping like the other nations around them. This cycle has gotten worse and worse and worse for the people of God, and they find themselves crying out now that they could have a king for a number of reasons, the primary of which is they really want to look like the nations around them. They want a physical representation of leadership, not just an understanding of the God they love and serve, but somebody they can point to to say, and he leads us. Not just God leads us, but and he leads us. And in frustration of their disobedience, God says that they can have a king. And Saul is chosen as that first king. And as Saul becomes king, things start out okay for him, but it doesn't take long. And still, he starts disobeying God pretty often also. One of the consequences of that is that God will end up informing him that he won't be the person whose kingdom will continue, that the next king won't be one of his heirs. It will come from somewhere else. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, Samuel, kind of his uh, prophet, voice person, judge, royal official alongside Saul, is letting him know that. Saul's just done some sacrifices and burnt offerings that he wasn't supposed to do and be in charge of and he's being confronted about that by Samuel and Samuel's telling well you didn't keep the command the Lord God you gave you if you had he'd established your kingdom over Israel for all time verse 14 says this though but now your kingdom will not endure the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command If you're reading through the Bible chronologically, you don't know it yet, but that's about David. And that phrasing that's listed there, a man after God's own heart, is the consistent phrasing much of us know to be who David is. It's how Scripture records him. And let's be clear, it records his heart that way, though his actions at times are often far from that. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And appointed him ruler of his people. That's going to be the story of David as he is king. Chosen by God as a man after God's own heart. That story takes place a couple of chapters later in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It opens this way. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. As Samuel hears it, his first response isn't, that sounds great, God. It's this, how am I supposed to do that? If I go and tell Saul I'm leaving to go anoint the next king, Saul's not going to be super happy about that. I might have some physical consequences. I don't know that that's comfortable. And so, so God says, that's okay. Just plan a sacrifice. Go and uh, take a sacrifice with you and then invite the, the Jesse and his family and the elders to this worship service together. And then there you'll be able, I'll direct you to the one that you are to anoint for me. I'll indicate who it is. Verse 4 says, Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him, and they asked, do you come in peace? Bethlehem's about six miles away from Jerusalem, and it wouldn't have been common for one of the royal officials and a spokesperson of God to have come uniquely to their town. They're used to Samuel going to places to give warnings of the places Israel's about to go destroy and where the army is headed and what it looks like to fight on behalf of God. And so they're like, well, this guy's coming here, maybe he's telling us something we've done wrong and that maybe we're about to have the army show up. Are are you here in peace? 
they ask while trembling? And so Samuel replies, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to celebrate. It doesn't tell us what kind of consecration this is in this instance. There's a few different ways that that could have looked in the Jewish uh, life at that time. It might have been the kind of consecration of just a uh, washing of hands and feet and, and things like they would have done before a lot of meals. It could have looked like the kinds of consecration that often the scribes and priests would do where it was a full bath that they would have to take ceremonially consecrating themselves for worship in a unique way. But whatever we know about it, we know that it was important. Because it wasn't just a worship service you walked into. It was one with enough significance that there was pomp and circumstance put around it. There was consecration put around it. The elders and Jesse and his sons are there for the sacrifice. And Samuel is there to see who would be indicated as the next king. When they arrived... Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. This has to be the guy, the oldest son, the the blessed one in the family, the heir, the leader. This has to be the guy. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Most literally, the Hebrew says, people look at the face, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's easy for us to get caught up in in judging people at what we might call face value. Their actions, their behaviors, their looks, their reputation. And approving or dismissing them based on that. Samuel has done that. He's looked at Eliab and said, oh, this is the one I approve. I look at face value, take it for what it's worth and approve. And yet God says, no, no, that isn't the way this goes. We're going to look at the heart instead. This is true not just of God, uh, but it makes it interestingly true, I imagine, of Jesse and his family. Like I said, there was pomp and circumstance. I imagine they find this as a significant experience. One of the royal officials have come and they get to celebrate with him. And yet what we'll end up finding out is that he didn't even bring his whole family. He came with seven of his eight sons but left one of them out in the field. The kind of experience that's being set apart enough and unique enough that you imagine you'd want to invite everybody to. And David's ignored When it's time for the parade of his sons to come in front of Samuel, he sends his first and best, his oldest, his blessed, his heir out. Because face value and outward appearance says that's what's supposed to happen. God says, I don't look at that, I look at the heart. The reality is we're no different. We often fall into the same temptation most of humanity has for all of its history and judge people at face value and outward appearance and miss the heart. And not just other people, not even just strangers, our own families, we can do that too. We don't see the heart. We see the practical things, the physical things, the outward things, the resume kinds of things. And we miss the heart. God's making sure that won't happen in this situation. And I think the hope is is that he would make sure that that doesn't happen with our families or anyone. And so then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Like a parade of his heirs at a celebratory family moment where they're invited to worship with the royal official and see who may get anointed. And it's none of them. And Samuel then has to ask, because God said, I'm going to indicate someone. And so Samuel asks again, 
So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We'll not sit down until he arrives. Like, wasn't this special enough that you wanted to invite everybody? Send for the one that isn't here. I need to see him as well. And then I tried to imagine what David's day would be like. He's out tending sheep the same way he's tended sheep for a long time. Kind of his job in the family at the moment. And this would have been one of the jobs that was looked down upon. This is like the grunt work of the day and age. And as Samuel's out doing that, somebody comes to him. It doesn't say who, so I'm just going to assume for now that it's a messenger. And a messenger shows up and says, oh, hey, David, this really, really cool thing has happened. And we've all, we've all been worshiping with the royal official, and it's been great. They asked, they invited our whole family to come. They consecrated us beforehand. Sorry we forgot to think of you and that you've missed it so far. But they really want you too. We didn't invite you, but, but the, the royal official Samuel, he really wants you to come. And so David comes. It doesn't say if he had to go through the same kind of consecrating process or not. But there's potential that he's coming, hearing about all of this, going through this consecrating process, wondering why this is happening why it's already happened for the rest of his family and he isn't there yet. And then he shows up. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Your translation might say something different than glowing health. It might say he was ruddy in appearance or there's one or two translations that actually say he was reddish in appearance. It's literally talking about the complexion of his face. The ruddy or reddish or glowing means he had a tint to his skin that was healthy. Uh, healthy for one who had been working outside. And he had fine appearance and handsome features. Some of them define those as beautiful eyes in some translations. It, it, it fascinates me that in the midst of even telling the story of David, we still get included all the face value things. But we also get included what comes next. The Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Not by face value. Samuel likely remembers the words from chapter 13. The one I've chosen is a man after my own heart. This is the one. This is the heart that matters. This is who I'm choosing. And so Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel then went to Ramah. Josephus, one of the early church historians and historians actually of the first century, wrote about this particular story in roughly 90 A.D., writing about what happens as he's telling the story and his own kind of commentary of it. He, he has a quote. This is what he says in the first century. I imagine that the aged Samuel whispered in David's ear the meaning of the anointing symbol, leaning in and letting him know, you're going to be the next king. You're going to be the next king. And that day the Spirit of the Lord came on him powerfully. We've already covered it, so it's a slightly rhetorical question, but the question is, why was David chosen? The answer is because he was a man after God's own heart. Not because of outward appearance, not because of resume, not because of success, and not because of what he's done. And I just want to remind us before we move on that when God has chosen us, it's not because of what we've done either. Uh, Paul writes about it. It's not going to come up on the screen, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing about why people are chosen. This is what he says in verse 26 through 30 or 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. 
It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is lit, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. As David, it was chosen. It was because of his heart for God, not because of anything else. That's no different from us. As we were chosen, it was because of who God has made us, not because of who we made ourselves. We did not earn it. And it says when, God was cho- when David was chosen and anointed that the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. And I also just want to remind us individually that that's true of us as well. That when you received the gift of Christ in your life, the Spirit of God comes powerfully on you. We share that same story. Maybe more importantly for our context this morning and in the series we're in, We share that story, but so do others. And when we look at them, sometimes their actions may look foolish and unwise and not noble. And yet God has still chosen them. We may despise what they've done, and yet God chooses the despised. And God says in the midst of them responding to the grace of Jesus in their life, he places his spirit powerfully on them as well. And so as we're tempted to just look and judge at face value, I think God reminds us, look instead at the heart. And I think he says that about our own families. When we at times see broken relationships and reconciliation that needs to happen, when we look at behaviors that have been damaging and harmful, we're not discounting that. God says in the midst of that, though, While those things have consequences and matter, our judgment is supposed to come based on their hearts. We should be listening for his understanding of who they are, not just forming our own based on outward appearance. Whether that's your nuclear family or your extended family, God's hope is that we would look at our family and judge them based on their hearts. David hears this and has the Spirit of God come powerfully on him, and we may ask the question, Well, how does he respond? Does he begin to live with this air of pride and begin to tell everybody about this anointed experience and what's happening and that he's going to become king? And does he begin to use that over his brothers or over his friends or over uh, the people in Bethlehem? That's not what we see. What we see is a story where Saul is getting tormented by uh, an evil spirit that's been sent by God for his own disobedience and frustration, and he's longing for music to help comfort him. In the midst of that, one of his servants says in verse 18, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, and he's a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. And then it tells us we get a picture of how David had responded to his anointing. And then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. He just went back to being a shepherd. One of those lowly positions. Anointed to be king, and yet he went back to faithful service in his family as the shepherd. It'll go on as it tells its story to start talking about him uh, coming and and playing music for Saul and God using that uh, in those moments and Saul feeling better as that would take place. And then it starts to tell of uh, David seeing some of what's taking place in the kingdom, particularly as the Philistines are attacking. And Goliath is coming out and demanding someone come and fight against him. He's shouting that someone would come and fight him and that he would stand on behalf of his God and that somebody needed to stand on behalf of Israel and yet everybody is afraid of that. And as David is, or as Goliath has issued the challenge, some of David's siblings are on the battlefront and his father Jesse wants to know what's going on. It says in verse 13 of chapter 17 that Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. And the firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Even while given stature to play music for the king. David does that and the moment that the king feels better. He's like, okay, can I go back and do my family duties with the sheep now? 
He doesn't say, hey, do you know that I'm going to take over? I want to learn everything I can. He says, no, I've got to go continue to do what I've been doing. As Jesse sent him to get that message from his brothers and sisters, it says in verse 20, early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. Still tending to the sheep. He had to leave the flock. God says that and sees his heart for serving. His brothers see that and judge it for its outward appearance as a lowly job. One they don't even know if he's doing well. He makes his way to the battlefield and when he gets there he's talking to his oldest brother Eliab and this is what it says in verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. You're the lowly one. Go do your lowly job. If you're not, it's because I know your heart is wicked. Which is interesting at the same time, God is saying, no, this is the man I've chosen because his heart is after me. And we'll see plenty of stories where David's heart leads him astray. He is no way perfect. But in this moment, God is saying, no, no, no. Well, I've judged him by his heart. That's what matters. And David will hear the call from Goliath, wonder why nobody's standing up to him. David will be in conversation with Saul and say, I'll go fight if nobody else will. And Saul would say, why would you do that? You're not a warrior. You're not in the army. You're not trained for that. And he'll start to recite his experiences as a shepherd. The lions and the bears, as they came, I've had to fight against them. I've been prepared for something like this. And he orients his experience to how God has prepared David's confidence ultimately is in who God is. As we're wrapping this up, I want to uh, just solidify this for what it means for our families. What I, think, what I think we can learn from this younger part of David's life as we think about our own families. Whatever the role is in your family, I think the hope is that we would have confidence in who God is like David had had confidence in who God is. And so that as a family, I think part of our jobs is to instill in our families a confidence in who God is. To instill in our families a confidence in who God is. And so I want to give us some options of how we can do that. How can we do that while we connect with other people in our family? You can start this way. Start by letting them know how God has uniquely made them. Talk to your family members about the unique aspects of God you see in their lives. There was a time, uh, a couple of, well, maybe over a decade ago or so now, that my wife and I were aiming to do something unique for Christmas. And for Christmas that one year, we decided that, that what we would try to do is write and capture an image for everybody in our family we were exchanging Christmas gifts with in a way that we saw the image of God represented in them. That we could understand God better because of the way we saw the image of God in other people. And so we would write, for instance, of my father and his generosity. And how we see the image of God in him because he is generous in a way that models the way God wants us all to be generous. We had nieces and nephews that we wrote about the passion that they have. And those parents would, throughout those days, look at us and say, oh, We're so glad you see it too. We thought these were the kinds of things only we saw as parents, but you see the godly things in our kids as well. This week, if you're looking to to instill in your family a confidence in who God is and in who they are in their heart and not just their resume, talk with them about how you see God has uniquely made them. And second, if you're looking to grow, in your own relationship with God. I'd encourage you to spend time this week reframing some of your experiences to understand how God may have been preparing you. Now, David did this with shepherding. He shepherded faithfully, but, but when, when God was on the move, he reframed his experience as a shepherd to what God had prepared him for. It happened to be something very different from shepherding, fighting against Goliath, but he reframed his experience not just as a resume of his accomplishments, 
but as in God working in and through his life. And I'd encourage you to look through your life and frame some of your experiences. Just ask the question, God, what have you been using these experiences to prepare me for? God may reveal that in his grace to you. That you haven't just been working a nine to five job. You haven't just been going to school. You haven't just been encountering your neighbors or friends. You haven't just been caring for your family. God has been using those things to prepare you for something for his kingdom. Third, if you want to do it while participating in what God's doing, I'd encourage you to memorize and apply Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. It's a set of verses that Jesus quotes, reads from a scroll at a synagogue. It's a set of verses that Isaiah prophesies about the coming servant and Messiah. It's a set of verses that's for people who have the Spirit of God on them, like David did, and like if you've accepted Christ, you do. And it tells you what your role is, because the Spirit of the Sovereign God is on you, what He has anointed you to do. And if you want to participate in what God is doing in your life and in your family, maybe you'll start by memorizing what God says those with the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord are anointed to do. And you start playing that out in your life, in your family, and in the world around you. You start breaking down barriers and setting people free You'd see miracles happen as God moves and redeems and restores through people who he's placed his spirit on, which includes you and your family. I want to pray that our families would model that well, that we'd be instilled with the confidence in who God is, how he's uniquely made us, shaped us, and placed his spirit on us. God, I'm thankful for your examples in stories like Samuel's choosing and anointing of David as you recognize that it's not just a list of resumes and works that matter and that you don't just judge based on behaviors, but you see deeper and further than that. You see into our hearts, you see into our spirits, you see how you've made us, you see how you've redeemed us, and you count that for our benefit even when the world around us or our own families may miss it. And yet we pray then that we would respond well that we would respond like Samuel did with an understanding quickly that we shouldn't just judge at face value and outward appearance, that we should look at the heart also. And so help us to have your eyes like Samuel did. Help us to hear from you clearly like Samuel did. Help us to then encourage others with the words of confidence you have for them like Samuel did. And as we do so, help us to respond well like in this season of his life, David did. Not taking it as arrogance or pride, but using it to understand how you have shaped us to work alongside you for the benefit of your name and your kingdom. That's something we all hope for personally. That's something we all, I imagine, hope for with our families. So whatever role we have in our family, help us to do that well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you go, I hope you go with grace. I hope you go with peace. I hope you go instilling confidence in your family about who God is. Go well this afternoon. You are dismissed.